Hi there, I'm Garrett Graff. I'm the director of the Cyber Initiative at the Aspen Institute, and I am pleased you're joining us today for another one of our series of briefings on mis- and disinformation hosted by the Aspen Institute in tandem with our Commission on Information Disorder. We're talking to top experts in the field who can help us make sense of the various facets of the information crisis. These briefings are designed as a resource for our commissioners and the broader public, and we hope that you find this series, which we're calling Disinfo Discussions, both useful and informative. In today's episode, I'm speaking with Graham Brookie, director of the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab. Graham served in various positions at the White House and the National Security Council, including as an advisor on strategic communications with a focus on digital strategy and audience engagement for President Obama's national security and foreign policy effort. We're going to be talking today about the challenges of nation states in the disinformation information disorder space and what makes nation states such a uniquely challenging policy problem. Graham, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. This is a, an, an incredibly important topic, and there's been a lot of conflation around, you know, a bunch of distinct but interconnected pieces, and this is a really, really big part of it. So, so uh, Graham, could you give us a sense of where you see the nation state challenge and the nation state threat lying in, here in 2021? Yeah, so the basic challenge, the challenge that touches all of the other kind of subset of this issue is that there aren't international norms for the thing that we kind of interpret as influence operations. There are international norms in this space. And so within that, there aren't uniform or accepted international definitions. I think some of the most useful definitions in this space were actually part of the coordinated intelligence assessment from the US intelligence community and about elections specifically, but you could kind of extrapolate them to other topics. And I'll read them. It's first and foremost, influence operations includes overt and covert efforts by a foreign government uh, or actors acting as agents of or on behalf of a foreign government intended to directly or indirectly affect an outcome or preference. And that's a lot different than, different than interference, which is a subset of foreign influence targeted at specific technical aspects or a, a very specific outcomes. And so in the context of elections, for instance, influence operations would be the effort to change perceptions within a large population and interference would be things like tapping into voting machines to change outcomes. And so within that, we can talk about foreign influence, uh, but it includes a lot of things and it can include information. And that's what we're talking about here today but it also could include a lot of other versions of influence. And so figuring that out as an issue of foreign policy or as an issue of, of national security importance is really, really critical to figuring out how to deal with this much broader topic that the commission is taking on of information disorder. And, and, and could you talk a little bit about where you see this threat manifesting across the geopolitical landscape? You know, who's good at this? Uh, who is adopting it? I mean, you've done some work on how this is playing out in Africa, among other places. Um, and, and I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how you view the threat actors in this space right now. Yeah, so I mean, influence operations, and, and here, most generally, we're talking about online influence operations, right? The influence operations that take shape and form in this online information ecosystem uh, that is truly global. And it's a reflection of the fact that when we're talking about the stuff that nation states do to other nation states, we're talking about the fact that we're in this truly global competition for information. Uh, and I think that we've seen this proliferation of efforts, especially in foreign influence. And I, that's an extension of, or that's a byproduct of the fact that in the last five years or so, we're looking more for it, right? So there's there's more groups like uh, the commission or like the DFI lab at the Atlantic Council or even the government efforts or private sector efforts like at the social media companies where we're looking for foreign influence operations. And so we're seeing more of them. 
But at the same time, we're seeing a proliferation of actual foreign influence efforts because it is a low cost, high yield assertion of national power. And by that, I mean, just to put it as pithily as possible, it's a lot cheaper for a country to uh, take on influence operations or incorporate influence operations into their foreign policy or their assertion of foreign policy than it would be to achieve the same outcome by a full ground force invasion of whatever territory to impact that outcome. And so we're seeing a lot more of this uh, and we're seeing a lot more of it around the world and we're seeing a lot more of it take on different tools, tactics, uh, incentives, intents. Uh, and that ranges from uh, the things that we kind of first think of when we think of foreign influence, right? The, the Russian troll factory in 2016 doing election interference uh, to this new trend of disinfo for hire to this old trend of traditional kind of counterintelligence operations that are very narrowly tailored in scope, but includes some element of foreign influence. And we have examples of this in primary source research from around the world from a lot of different uh, some of the actors that we think of as the most prominent for sure uh, are Russia, and that, that is true. Uh, we see a lot more uh, very assertive and aggressive foreign influence efforts from Russia, or going back to that definition of influence, uh, actors acting on behalf or of, of or as agents of uh, the Russian government. Uh, we see an increasingly assertive uh, China, uh, on the world stage using a lot of different tactics that are uh, frankly different than Russia. And so we can kind of dive into that. And then we see a lot of actors, especially from adversarial states like Iran uh, to an extent Venezuela, although their influence operations look a little different than, uh, than for instance, Iran's. So we see a lot of nations engaging in this kind of activity for a lot of different outcomes. And that's really important on a case-by-case -case basis. So we don't just glob them all into one of uh, foreign influence is a thing and we should do one thing about it. Uh, it's really, it, for us, and when we do research, it's really taken on a case-by-case -case basis to come to ground truth on what we're actually seeing. And Graham, uh, I don't know whether you can hear it. I have uh, some Vermont Air National Guard flying over the house right now. Uh, go U.S. Air Force. Um, if you could talk a little bit about the perceptions of the current threat landscape versus where you see the biggest actual risk. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would hope that uh, it's actually the National Guard uh, flying over the house as opposed to a, a, a malign influence operation or an interference operation to keep you from having a, a clear and coherent conversation about this uh, national security vulnerability. Uh, one of the things, much to your point, Garrett, is this, right, this need to right size the perception of the threat, the actual threat landscape of foreign influence operations. Uh, and there, the main lesson is that over the last few years, again, this has become a real kitchen table topic in especially the United States. Uh, and so after 2016 and after the specifically the Russian influence operations targeting U.S. presidential elections that year, uh, this has now become a, a topic that, you know, if you show up in the middle of the United States and, and talk to somebody that doesn't think about these things every single day, they'll, they'll pretty much know what you're talking about, right? Like they've probably seen it or heard it or, uh, or consumed information about foreign influence operations. About, not they've consumed foreign influence operations. I want to be very, very clear about that. Uh, and so where, where this has now become a, a, a topic of national discussion, the perception of foreign influence has sometimes very much outpaced the actual threat or the actual impact of foreign influence operations. And that in and of itself, this is where this gets really, really tricky. That outcome in and of itself, creating the specter of foreign influence operations as opposed to the impact of foreign influence operations. In other words, making people scared that they might be targeted or vulnerable to foreign influence operations is in and of itself a 
uh, an outcome that a foreign influence operator would very much like. Uh, and so this is where this concept of resilience comes in and is extremely important. That we have to both, uh, A, be able to right size and, and talk about this as a very real national security vulnerability, but also be confident in the fact that not everything is a foreign influence operation. Not everything that you disagree with on the internet is this kind of meme of a Russian bot. And that's a real challenge. So right-sizing the perception versus the threat. Uh, and that's not to say that the threat of foreign influence isn't a very real national security vulnerability. It is. The fact that a, that a foreign country or an adversarial country could influence outcomes that affect the, the target, the shared set of facts that democracy depends on in a government that is truly foreign by people, that, that undermines self-determination, that undermines the whole, the whole uh, process of democracy. So that's a very real national security threat. But we can't let the fear of that threat get in the way of, of that process as well, uh, get in the way of that shared set of facts that we're talking about. So how do you, uh, um, as someone who looks at this issue, studies this issue professionally, um, how do you avoid encountering disinformation, countering uh, information influence operations, avoid giving the adversary the victory that you are talking about? I mean, how do you successfully counter these operations without achieving the goals of the operation in the first place? This comes back to this concept of, of resilience, right? We've got to be able to talk about this very real national security threat in a way that doesn't make it uh, a way, way, way bigger than it, than it is. Uh, and so that comes back down to two elements of our information environment that are critically important, which is transparency and accountability. Uh, whenever we're making, we being a, a large research body that, or a large research group that has a large body of work across this set of issues, whenever we're making claims of foreign in interference or attribution of foreign influence, uh, we're extremely clear about how we came to that conclusion. And regardless of how much you know, data underpinning that finding there is, especially when you get into government sources, right, government will be typically slightly less transparent about how they came to a conclusion or, or the evidence, the sources and methods that they use to come to that conclusion um, than a group that does open source research like mine. But describing the process and describing the conclusion is incredibly important. We've seen that from a lot of different groups that are making more attributions or more findings of foreign influence, regardless of whether those are civil society groups like ours uh, or government groups like the ODNI, the Office of Director of National Intelligence Assessment about US elections that I just mentioned, or frankly, monthly disclosures of coordinated inauthentic behavior, including some by nation states, by companies like Facebook. And so that degree of transparency or that degree of regular engagement about this threat landscape is really, really critical in building up the expectation that this is an ongoing threat. This isn't going away anytime soon, but that's not a reason to lose sleep at night or miscontextualize or, or overcorrect for the challenge. We've got to be very clear in what the threat is and very clear in the way that we talk. about it. So speaking of losing sleep at night, um, in the classic formulation of national security questions, um, in this space, what are the things that keep you up at night in terms of the looming challenges of disinformation campaigns and information operations. Yeah, among among nation states, the thing, I, for those of you that are watching on video, you can see a bunch of books behind me. And one of the books that is behind me is The Guns of August. Uh, the Guns of August is about World War I and the catastrophic failure of decision makers to understand the implications of their decisions matched with technological progress that had been made in the years leading up to World War I. And it led to a catastrophic world war. And I think that one of the things that sticks out to me in this truly global competition for information is that in general, nations do not have a clear set of international norms, much to the very first point that we, that we talked about. And that can lead to 
extremely dangerous escalation. And, and I'll give you an example, which is probably not the example that most of the listeners will have kind of thought of in, in the international relations space, right? Not election security or not uh, foreign influence in the context of, of war zones. It's actually COVID-19. And the way that nations have positioned, especially one of the studies that we did earlier this year around COVID-19 was tracking narratives that were either false or unverified about the origins of coronavirus. And the way that nations position themselves around narratives in a hostile way during the middle of a global health crisis. And so it, it specifically, there was one narrative that uh, the United States had created coronavirus in Luger Labs, which is a, a biochemical facility that's based in the country of Georgia. And Russia was, was very hot on that narrative, uh, or state media in Russia reported it pretty consistently. Uh, there was another narrative that uh, the Chinese government had intentionally created the coronavirus uh, in order to wreak havoc on the rest of the world. Uh, that's unverified. There were a bunch of other narratives that were unverified in the middle of a, of a pandemic, which by definition requires global action. And a lot of those narratives were doubled down on by public leaders in those countries. And so as they escalated in those narratives, it put their countries in positions that they couldn't back down. from. And that's an escalation in a truly global competition for information based on unverified information that could lead to very real conflict. And that really keeps me up at night. And in, in that case specifically, what that did is it prevented more coordination around a public health response that was truly global and actually effective. So there are very real consequences to this, and especially around escalation, and especially around unverified or, uh, or this kind of concept of information disorder and what nations do with that type of for lack of a better word, this is a technical term, what they do with that hot potato, it, it doesn't make any sense. And until we have rules of the road for countries and strategies around that, and especially countries that are considered to be free and open or democratic countries, because frankly, authoritarian countries or autocratic countries are playing by a different set of rules. And there has to be a cost for that. And I think that's a second category of things that keep me up at night around this set of issues. Uh, but the escalation of this space is incredibly volatile, under understood, and dangerous. And so what do those norms look like to you? You know, if you were in charge of the uh, new United Nations compact on uh, countering information disorder, um, what, how, what rules of the road should the U.S. be driving towards, um, both in democratic regimes and authoritarian ones? Well, I think we have a pretty good understanding of things that we generally don't consider to be on board or above board, right? Uh, things like interfering or influencing another country's self-determination. Right. And, the, and what I want to clarify there is the people within that country's right to self-determination. So that especially matters for democracies. Uh, so things like foreign interference in elections, that's definitely not above board. Uh, what does that mean for actual areas of conflict? Right. Uh, there's a lot of debate in the United States right now, especially among the military community, about whether or not psyops or the psychological operations, which are, is not a term of art that the US military uses anymore, but uh, where influence operations in areas of active hostilities are acceptable or not, uh, or what are the mechanisms by which government entities declassify accurate information in order to expose bad behavior, especially with regard to foreign influence. And so there's a lot of things that we, a, don't have figured out as, as government bureaucracies uh, and, and our outstanding questions. But we generally know what we don't consider to be okay. What we don't have a good idea of is what we consider to be absolutely okay or what is in uh, the realm of acceptable 
with regard to influence, especially in a globalized and hyper-connected information environment. Uh, and so I, there shouldn't be, I, I, there isn't an expectation, there can't be an expectation that another country won't have a vested interest in outcomes in a country that they either work with or compete with on a regular basis, right? It's logical for the United States to have a view on what happens in elections in an allied country, right? Um, if, if there is an actor that is running for election or, or positing against the United States in that allied country, then the United States is probably within their right to be, you know, not as welcoming of that stance as, as, as uh, you know, as that actor might expect them to be. Uh, but we need to have norms for that space. And so I, I, let's talk about media as an example. The United States has international public media. And that's a lot different than something like state-backed media or state-controlled media. And in the realm of international norms, public media is above board, right? Uh, the United States government doesn't have editorial control over what, for instance, Radio Free Europe is reporting on. Uh, and that's not the case compared to state controlled media like RT and Sputnik, where the Russian government absolutely has, has influence or direct control over editorial standards for that, uh, for that media outlet or for that set of media outlets. And so in the realm of international norms, we need to be able to distinguish between what is acceptable using the example of media, public media is probably acceptable in that, in that scenario versus state controlled or manipulated. Uh, and you could extrapolate that to all of these areas of influence that kind of fall into subcategories of foreign influence. And so um, in the context of this commission, where do you think there are achievable policy solutions to the disinformation, information uh, operations problem uh, regarding nation states? I mean, what should the U.S. government be doing differently? What could the tech sector be doing differently to actually make a difference in solving or combating this problem? I think there's a difference between direct responsibility and then standards for the entire space. And within direct responsibility, we're talking about responding to specific elements of information disorder. Right, or what do we want the government's responsibility to be in responding to things like election related disinformation, whether that comes from foreign actors or domestic actors. And there is a lot of debate about what that should look like. And then there are the standards for the space, the information environment, where we're talking about extremely kind of baseline standards for what it means to be a, a a free and open society online, or that's connected to this moment in history where humans have more access to information than at any point, as well as are more connected than at any point. And there's a lot of opportunity with that, but there's also a lot of vulnerability, especially as that information environment is, in my opinion, irreversibly globalized. And so what are the standards for an information environment that doesn't respect our neatly defined borders? Uh, and doesn't respect the fact that like, I, there isn't one place in the information environment that, that we, regardless of where we are at, what country we are in, can connect and engage, right? It's not limited to one platform. It's not limited to one information outlet. And so what are the standards for that? And right now, as a matter of policy, especially in democratic countries, there aren't standards for what a free and open information environment look like. And specifically within democracies, there aren't standards for the internet, right? The internet and the, the expectation of privacy and the expectation of freedom of expression are completely different in even among extremely close and allied democracies. The internet in the United States is is governed in a completely different way or a, 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 a substantially different way than even the European Union or Australia or Israel, for instance. And until we, until we have 
not necessarily, I'm not advocating for the same laws. That, that is not an achievable outcome. But the same set of values and principles for what this space looks like, especially as technology progresses, especially as we get into um, not necessarily, as we get beyond content moderation debates of like which specific piece of content should be on the internet in this country or not, and into uh, emerging technologies, whether that's surveillance technologies or, or, or dating usage, things like that. We don't have clear standards. And until we do, we're backfilled to a more uh, balkanized or autocratic or authoritarian vision for that information environment. And that's a serious challenge. So being clear-eyed about that, to answer your question directly, I think being clear-eyed about the fact that that's an enormous challenge is the only way that we're gonna be able to solve a lot of these both structural policy challenges as well as uh, discrete policy challenges on discrete issues like election security. I, what else stands out to you as, um, you know, this is an enormously complex uh, policy challenge. I mean, it is, uh, uh, you know, in, in many ways, actually more complex than climate change um, in, in terms of its actors and the, the controversy around it and, and the, uh, the need for unified action in a very ununified space. Um, where do you hope that the U.S. government over the next four years actually devotes its effort uh, strategy-wise, priority-wise to combating this, this problem? Integration is the one word answer. There needs to be an integrated strategy that realizes the fact that a lot of these discrete challenges with regard to information disorder, whether they're considered to be domestic policy challenges like increasing domestic radicalization from resulting from online engagement uh, to foreign influence and what that looks like because foreign influence sometimes preys on those vulnerabilities those domestic vulnerabilities to things like tech policy regulation they're all part of the same overarching challenge of information disorder and until those various components and varied components of that wider issue set are actually connected until the the right hand is working with the left hand on any of these issues uh, any discrete uh, kind of solution will be disconnected from a, from the much wider set of issues and so integration across this entire space the fact that foreign policy and domestic policy are the same on this set of issues on, on tech policy writ large, uh, the fact that regulation is a matter of foreign policy, uh, uh, domestic regulation is a matter of foreign policy, that's, that's incredibly important until this is a central component of a policy vertical that for lack of a better word would be little d democracy, uh, the standards for democracy, because be, again, a shared set of facts is foundational to a functioning democracy until we realize that that's a critical component and it, it interplays, interplays with these domestic policy and foreign policy components that's that's really important uh, so integration for sure um, that sticks out um, let me ask you one, one final question here before we wrap up which is uh, beyond the federal government um, do you do you believe that the tech platforms uh, are adequately policing this challenge on their own uh, platforms? Uh, do you think that self-regulation is the answer there? Uh, or does government need to take a firmer hand in that, uh, particularly on the, the coordinated uh, inauthentic behavior level? Um, do you think government needs to be taking a firmer hand with the tech platforms? Well, we started this conversation focusing on foreign influence operations and, and specifically the, the threats and the responsibilities of nations when it comes to interacting with other nations on vulnerabilities in our, or in the manipulation of our information environment. And so, bringing in private sector actors 
I, we think of this as a truly collective challenge where the tech platforms that create the underpinnings, the infrastructure of, of our information environment have direct responsibility for managing and making sure that that information environment is, is for lack of a better word, healthy or accurate. Uh, at the same time, self-regulation doesn't make any sense when we're talking about accountability. Uh, to an extent, a company is going to be accountable to its customers as opposed to a government being accountable to its citizens in this, this thing that we're talking about that is central to count, to making sure that we're not vulnerable to foreign influence. But the thing that we are trying to make sure that we're not vulnerable to, the thing that is not vulnerable to foreign influence is our ability to self-determine. And we don't self-determine to have uh, companies running all this stuff for us, right? So uh, where they absolutely have a role to play, they're essential, they're accountable to their bottom line and to their customers, and that really matters. Uh, there are incentives there where they have a, a, an incentive, an absolute incentive to be responsive to uh, our needs or to be accountable to our needs or to be accountable to providing us accurate information with which we can make decisions. But in the long run, they're not as accountable to us as our own governments are, especially in free and open societies or democratic societies. And so the basic answer is no, right? Uh, we need government to have a very active role in this space because that's the government's job. And where the tech companies can do absolutely more and should do more, I wouldn't expect them to act in a silo without more guidance from the bodies that are more directly responsible to me as a citizen and that's government mm -hmm. so yes all of the above we're in a situation where all of the a b and c d and e all of the above actors whether it's government media tech civil society we have this tendency to think about information disorder as somebody else's problem right oh yeah the, the, the social media companies should go do something about that where all these politicians should go do something about that or shouldn't do something about that. Uh, and it's all of our responsibility. Uh, it's a civic duty, but civic duty leads to democratic government. So. Yeah. Graham, thanks so much for joining us uh, for this briefing on the disinformation discussions for the Aspen Institute and our Commission on Information Disorder. Uh, appreciate your time and the insights you've shared with us. Good luck to the commission. I'm glad that you all are taking on this body of work and standing by to be helpful in whatever way we can. So, thanks so much for your time. Thank you.